I'm Clark Friesen, and I'm a professor of speech communication here at the college, and I've been here since 02. And um, just, just as a basic introduction of myself, I, my interest has always been to promote service learning on the campus. Um, in addition to teaching my classes, uh, the, the teaching style that I have sort of found during my career and uh, really embraced is the idea of having students learn through serving in the community. That is, if you can combine the service to community partners with the classroom teaching, you can really get students to understand the material in a new way, to understand their role in the community, and to become, hopefully, civically engaged. That's the output uh, or the hopeful end of a service learning project. That's not to say that it always happens. There are times when it doesn't. But in the last year, civic engagement has been embraced by the system. Um, early in the last spring, the system office, the chancellor said, I'd like to invest in civic engagement. And that follows along with what the state wants from us in terms of civic and personal responsibility. We want, they want our students to learn civic and personal responsibility. And so um, the chancellor said, well, let's put some money behind that and have centers for civic engagement on all the campuses. And we'll have a coordinator who uh, organizes that, which is what I do now. I coordinate that as well as service learning and the Speaking Excellence Center, which is in room C210, and uh, then also teaching my speech classes. So uh, I've got a full plate of things that I do. But civic engagement is not a difficult job here at Tomball, in part because we do a lot with it already. It's not something that started from nothing. Uh, the culture here at Tomball has always been to have um, an involvement, a partnership with the community. We are the only campus in the system where uh, the, the community said, we want this college, we want a college for ourselves, and we're gonna go to the state and make sure that they, get, they give us one. And so, and, and we're the only one that have that uh, are part of a community like that. And we've always given back. We've always made a difference in our community as long as I've been here, and certainly before I came here, it's not like I invented the idea. That's something that's been part of the DNA of the college all along. So I sort of joined the college in its normal work. So I'm gonna spend some time today defining civic engagement. Uh, I find that as I've uh, begun doing this and coordinating this program, that a lot of people are like, what is that? And there are some people who say, it must be this. Or, well, when you do this, you're civically engaged, right? And I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So the reason I'm doing this presentation is in part to kind of give a clear picture of what I mean by that, what I think we mean by that, uh, what it means for Tomball to do it, okay? Uh, how Tomball accomplishes that or tries to accomplish it so that when we move forward, as we've had a really good year this year, but as we move forward, clarity on the idea of civic engagement is, is here and that others can hopefully benefit from the recording of this to, to see uh, what, what we mean by it as, uh, as time passes. So I'm gonna start out by bringing up my slideshow here. And the first thing I wanna do is to just ask a few questions about what you think civic engagement might be. For instance, is it defined by the number of people who serve? It is uh, a fact of life with regard to public institutions that are funded through tax dollars. How do you measure what you're doing? How do you know that you've accomplished civic engagement? So for instance, if we're spending tax dollars to accomplish this with our students, if we want at the state level, our students to become civically responsible, what does that mean? And how do we accomplish that? How do we measure it? So does it get measured by the number of people who serve? Uh, if we send out 10 students to work in a senior facility in, in the community, have we accomplished making those students civically engaged? If we have 100 students uh, who participate in a bill for Habitat for Humanity, have we accomplished civic engagement for our students? If we have 1,000 students on a particular day serving in the community right during the semester, which we've done, right? We've had um, large-scale service events in, this, in the city. Uh, does that count as civic engagement? And the answer, in my opinion, is no, right? 
the number of people involved doesn't equate to civic engagement. Just because they're out there doing something doesn't mean that they have a mentality for civic engagement. They are engaged in civic work, but are they civically engaged? So there's more to it than that, right? Uh, how about the type of activity? What if they are pulling weeds for, a, for a, an elderly person in the community? What if they're doing an oral history? Uh, what if they are mentoring children at the elementary or junior high, right? Does that count? And the answer is again, no, not really. Just because they're doing that doesn't mean that it gives them a sense of involvement with the community, a sense of agency, right, with with the with the community. They might do the activity as assigned to them. They might accomplish and spend time doing so. But does that mean that they'll necessarily become civically engaged? And the answer is no, not necessarily. So any kind of activity, whether that's service learning, whether that's public achievement, whether that is a hunger banquet that they attend, whether that is a debate watch we were talking about before we started. You know, just because you go to that event or write a letter to Congress or whatever it is that you do, that doesn't mean that you become civically engaged by having just done it, okay? The activity itself doesn't necessarily guarantee civic engagement. Is it, are people compelled by a sense of duty? You know, that's one of the things that we have in our society is a, a sense of civic duty, right? You have uh, jury duty, for instance, right? I had that at the beginning of the semester in the in-service week. It's a duty, we call it that. Voting is considered a civic responsibility, right? You should vote. You're a voting citizen. People had to fight hard to give you the right to vote, right? You, and you know, there are, not, there are a lot of uh, countries in the world that don't give its citizens the right to vote. You should vote. And it's a sad fact that nationally, when we have presidential elections, we might not get 50% of the people to vote. And in Texas, the number is extremely low, the number of people who participate in voting, right? But we consider that a responsibility or a duty. Are the students of today, if you think about millennials, for instance, does that generation really view civic responsibility the way that previous generations did? And the answer is no, they don't. What we would prefer is for students to opt in to civic action, right? To want to do that. They kind of have an opt in, opt out kind of mentality, a lot of them. So, you know. You can tell them it's a duty, that they're required to do so, and a requirement, yeah, they'll probably do that requirement, but they won't want to. What we will hope is that people would want to be involved. That's civic engagement to me, right? That's engaged in the community affairs, wanting to do so. Is it defined by interaction with government? This is another way of defining civic engagement. The, the idea that the citizen can have input with the local government or the state government or the national government. For instance, you may remember earlier in the president's term that he established a sort of a website where you could suggest something to the government, like, you know, let us have a spaceship or, you know, let us do this. And if you got enough signatures, right, then, you know, the government would do it. After a while, they figured out, right, that, you know, people would get a lot of signatures for some really wacky and impossible things. Does that count as civic engagement when people write in like that? Uh, on a more smaller scale, communities and cities like ours, right, could have, um, what is it, 311, right, uh, access, where instead of 411 where you get information or 911 where you call, in, call for help, 311, you could, write, you could dial into the community and give them suggestions. Hey, we need more, you know, the street lights are broken in this part of town. We need those uh, replaced. Or we need to have uh, better, uh, you know, services with trash in this park, or something like that. You know, could you develop an app through a civic hacking program? Which, by the way, there are these kinds of things happening right here in Houston, where you develop an app that would benefit the community in some way, like trails along Spring Creek Greenway, right? You know, where we could have not only a map of the trails, but also capture photographs of you know, uh, interesting sites along the way that people could put on Instagram, and then it would appear on this, this app, and you could go, oh, I wanna go see that, and you would go and do those things. You know, is that civic engagement? That is a definition that is becoming right, much more prevalent, this idea of civic involvement through technology, for instance, right? So, you know, how do you define it? Uh, are these things really the idea behind that? Well, 
this is a small text here, and it's only because I want you to see that some people have thought about this over time, the definition. This is Thomas Ehrlich, who uh, is uh, a national higher ed leader in, in the idea of civic engagement. He's written books about it, like this one, Civic Responsibility in Higher Ed, where he says it means working to make a difference in the civic life of our communities and developing a combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation to make that difference. Now look at knowledge, skills, values, and motivation. The motivation part is the part that I'm thinking about, right? The want to. I want to do something. I know how. I have the skill to do it. I value it, and I want to do it, okay? It means promoting the quality of life in the community through both political and non-political processes. Now, just to stop on that last little phrase there, political and non-political processes. When you look at higher ed, college and university civic engagement centers, they have a variety of activities that are done on campus and in the community that are intended to achieve the outcome of civic engagement. Among those, for instance, are things like Voting, voter registration drives, um, deliberative dialogues, service learning like we do. And so there are some who promote civic engagement and they, they want to emphasize the political action piece. That is, they want students to not only know what's going on in the community, but want to have agency in the political process as a means of dealing with whatever the community needs are. So they want them to be involved as opposed to sort of the professional politicians that we have who get power and keep power and stay in power forever and you know we just kind of leave it up to them and then we get candidates we don't like but we don't participate you see what I mean so you know they want the, the there are voices among those even here in the system who want to emphasize the political part and that is a legitimate piece to that and then there's the non-political piece that says just being involved in the community and knowing the needs and doing work together that says we can solve this without government. We are self-governing as a nation. Right? We don't have to have necessarily a government solution to this or a political solution. We can have a community solution. And, and it just involves in you know getting people to the problem, ideas to the problem. You know, one of the things that I've always said about our college is that we have the largest collection of able-bodied adults outside of Walmart <laughs> in Tomball. And so if a problem needs human involvement, people to be involved, ideas to be put toward it. That's where you come to, us, the college. And the youth and the energy and the involvement can come from that, and it doesn't have to involve passing legislation or a city ordinance or going to a city council meeting necessarily. It could, right? That may be the legitimate pathway to solving it. But it could just involve human involvement. That doesn't involve the political processes. So, a morally and civically responsible individual recognizes themselves as a member of a larger social fabric. I think sometimes we get in our communities and we kind of live inside our home. We don't go outside, we don't know our neighbors, and we don't see our role in the community, that larger social fabric. Therefore, we consider social problems to be at least partly our own, right? Such an individual is willing to see the moral and civic dimensions of issues and to make and justify the moral and civic judgments and to take action when appropriate. So the problems that exist partly belong to us. Sometimes I think we kind of look at situations in our communities and we say, eh, that belong, that's happening to somebody else, right? That's people in Jersey Village, or that's people over in Navasota, or that's people in, in Willowbrook or in the Woodlands, right? That's not my problem. That's not my problem. And I think that sometimes the problems that exist even if it isn't directly yours, it's still something you care about and want to see resolved. There's poverty all around us. There's inequality around us. There's discrimination. There's um, pain and suffering going on around us. And it's easy to ignore. You put on your head earbuds and you don't have to talk to anybody in the hallway, right? You put your sunglasses on in the car and you don't have to make eye contact with anybody, right? There's no connection. And we, we find it easy to sort of disappear and disengage from others. So what Ehrlich is saying here is, this is a person who says, we know that there are problems, we know that it's at least partly something we, sh we can be helping with, and we want to do something, and we can justify what we do when we get involved. We understand it, we, can, we see the dimensions, and we can justify being involved. So, come on now, there we go. 
I think the characteristics involve concern for others over self. Okay? That's, that's one of the things, principles in communication. If you want a good relationship, you have to put others ahead of self. If you think about a definition of a hero, what do heroes do? They put others ahead of self. Right? We think of unethical individuals, our news is full of unethical individuals, and what do they do? They put self ahead of others. We know that the kind of characteristic we want of students coming out of our campus is gonna put others ahead of self. That's a big step, a big characteristic towards being civically engaged. You need to understand what the community needs are. You need to know what's going on around you, know what the needs are, they change over time, you need to be in touch with that. An awareness of your capacity to participate in community affairs. That is, do you have agency? Do you have the ability right, to do something about it? And sometimes I think students go, how am I supposed to fix that? What's my role in it? How could I do something? And I'm just me, right? But there are ways for you to get involved, and I think part of our teaching here has to be showing the ways to do so. Giving students experience in being involved. Right? Experience with the opportunities, the pathways, which is the key word today, right? Pathways toward being involved in the community. Are there such pathways for us here in Tomo? And then a desire to get involved and make a difference. The story I like to tell, and I've told this before, is one where students in my class were mentoring at the junior high across the street. The junior high where the they only had one full-time counselor for the entire student body, one full-time counselor for all those students. So can you see them all in a complete year? No, you'll never see them all. The counselor told me that as much as two-thirds of the populace there are at-risk students. At-risk students need a lot of attention for various reasons, because at-risk can be defined in a lot of ways. One full-time counselor for all those at-risk kids, they're not going to get seen, are they? So they need, they need caring adults in their lives. And sometimes that isn't found at home. But maybe through a 16-week class where students are mentoring, right, maybe our students could go over and mentor with them. And that's what I had them do. Somebody trying to finish? Wave them. Right. Come on. I got a few minutes. All right. So my students are mentoring during the 16-week semester. And they're spending time with these kids. And they're developing a relationship just by talking to them. How's your day going? How are your classes? What's going on? You know, hey, did you, you know, and they ask him questions. Are you a student at the college? What are you doing there? What do you study? Well, math like you and English like you. They're developing a relationship with them over 16 weeks, maybe an hour or so a week. The semester gets towards the end and my students come to me and one of them says, hey, we're almost done with class. What, what, what about the mentoring program? I said, what do you mean? Well, those kids have been expecting me, right? And now what, right? We're are we just supposed to stop volunteering? I said, I guess that's up to you. Well, they really need us. I mean, you know, we've spent a whole, you know, all this time. We know that they, they need us over there. You know, that, that they really, they're counting on this relationship. Huh. Well, what do you think we ought to do about that? Well, they need a, a program that will, you know, get them in connection with older adults that care about them, you know, through, the, through their years in school so that they get supported. Because you know in junior high, that's when a lot of, for instance, girls' self-esteem starts to hit, uh, hit a wall, right? So the students stopped wondering about their grade in the course, and they started wondering about the need that the community had, right? Particularly the school and those kids. And that lone uh, counselor there at the school, I wonder if she's still there, right? This has been years since I, this particular story happened. But you get the idea? That's where civic engagement takes place. It's a desire to get involved and make a difference. They knew that they could do this. They can, they're concerned for other people. They're not thinking about their grade. You know, like the student who asked me, you know, do I need to know this for the test? They're trying to jump through a hoop to get to where they're going, and I can understand that mentality. That's the way I was as a student too, right? I want to get a good grade. But can the teaching that we do here lead them farther? to be concerned for others over self, to see that they have a role, that something needs to be done and that they want to do something about it, and they start forgetting about the grade and start concerning themselves with the community, there's your civic engagement. Does that all make sense to you? So to me, civic engagement is an outcome of what we do. It is a desired outcome. It's not a guaranteed outcome. It has nothing to do with the number of people who are involved. Putting the number next to who's involved 
helps the state say, look at how many people we got involved in that kind of activity. That's great. The state loves tracking things like that. And you can even quantify the numbers, right, in terms of how many hours and decide how much that's worth, right, in monetary funds. But does that turn into engagement? When they leave us, will they still retain these characteristics, right? That's what we want. That's what I'm trying to get to with a Center for Civic Engagement. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about the ways in which we've already started working on that here and ways that we kind of plan on building off of this first year and show you how we can you know, try to achieve that outcome even more. So just ways, how does Tomball do this? Well, service learning projects, as I said, that's the reason I took this job. I started working here at Tomball because where I was working in the prison, you couldn't take convicted felons out in the community to learn through service. That would be great for them, right, in terms of recidivism, right, and teaching, you know, trying to avoid recidivism, trying to you know, teach them to be a, a functional member of the community. But I couldn't do that with convicted felons. That makes sense. So I took my job here so I could start practicing service learning. That's a teaching practice. In the same way that you might have a student write an essay or give a speech, you teach them through action, right, through experience. So, student life projects, every organization, student organization has an expectation that they have to do community service as a part of getting funds, right? So, we have them involved in the community, which could lead to civic engagement there. Voter registration drives, we've spent this entire year now trying to get people more involved. We have a partnership with an or organization called TurboVote, and it's a special website that Lone Star uh, faculty and staff and students can log into and it helps them to know where can you go to get registered and when's the next election coming up. And, you know, based on the information you gave us, here's where you need to go vote. And it reminds you, it sends you a little ping on your, on your phone. It says, hey, go vote today, okay? And we've had the League of Women Voters on campus to you know, help register people from different counties and so on, different areas. We have internships. We're developing an internship program. So far, we've only ever had just one intern. You know, and internships are typically later in your college experience, but we've been able to get one here in the first couple of years. Basic internships with local elected leaders, with the civic engagement program, to help us to do what we're doing, okay? So we're developing that. We've got new partners already online that say that they would love to have interns uh, with Precinct 4, for instance, with Tomball Emergency Assistance Ministry, that would they, they want to have people come and help them, right, through nonprofit agencies or through government agencies. Campus forums. We bring students in, we bring in, uh, them in to talk about the issues that matter to them, like, for instance, the campus carry law that's being passed. Well, it's been passed. Now we have to figure out how do we implement that. And in walks uh, Professor Gilbert, who has been instrumental in that, is a great timing uh, to come in on this particular note because what we do is we get them to come in and say, here's what we're gonna have to do. Well, what would you prefer? And they make, they make their, uh, they put their voice in on this. You know, one of the most important aspects of this is the idea of achieving student voice. We want students to feel like they have a voice. That's when they're gonna opt in, is when they feel like that they'll be heard. And I tell students all the time that there's a lot of things happening on this campus and the system, uh, you know, that deals with them, that's about them, that's for them, but is being decided without them. Okay, how much is tuition? What about books? What about the food services? You know, what about the guns on campus? That's all gonna get decided largely about them, but without them, right? The new student handbook was developed and there was a, an option on the website for students to participate in the development of that of the student rights and responsibilities. But I wonder how many students out of our 10,000, out of the 90,000 in the system actually even knew it was there, much less read it or commented on it. You see, I think student voice needs to be taught, right? Given the opportunity to use that student voice and through forums, we're able to do that, right? So they feel like they, they know how, the, how to get involved. Right, how to get involved and, and that their voice will be heard. So we've been had we've had candidates come to campus, we've had elected leaders come to campus, we've had guest speakers come in that you know are forums that where the speaker let, lets their ideas out and the speak and the students are able to comment back. 
where the students are able to put their ideas in as far as what's going to happen. And if that's the tollway going by the, the school here, and it's going to take out the front of the school, and it's also going to impact the, you know, the, fr the front entrance, mm -hmm. and uh, also you know, cut into our uh, wetland area that we maintain, what's, what's going to happen there? What about all those bats that are under that bridge? Or what about all the plants that we've been planting? Okay, what's going to happen there? Educational programs and activities. So we bring in speakers from outside. We have uh, Free Speech Week that we had in October, right? We have uh, conferences on civic engagement. Uh, all these kinds of activities and programs that are intended to say, look at all the different ways that you can be involved. Look at all the different means by which students' voice needs to be heard, right? Look at all the kind of activities uh, that are going on in the community that need more involvement that, aren't, that they're not getting, right? That gives students a sense of the breadth of that because not every student's going to be interested in the same thing. You can spend a lot of time on voter registration and elections, but not everybody's going to be turned on by that. Okay? You can talk about uh, the environment, but not everybody's turned on by that. But they might get turned on by a program about bullying, or they might get turned on, on a, about a program having to do with uh, human trafficking, which is really big, not far from our campus here. Okay? So, you know, the more that we can create opportunities, right, and different kinds of things, the more students are going to be involved. So student life, campus forums, programs, internships, voter registration, service, service learning, of course, can occur in any discipline on the campus, and does, from computer science to psychology to speech to biology. We're doing it in a lot of different ways. So we have a more interconnected and engaged campus. I changed the color scheme a little bit here just to keep you awake. Now, that's one of the things that Dr. Nutt said when she first came here, that she wanted to see more campus synergy. She wanted to see that instead of silos of activity, where people were sort of doing their own thing over here and doing their own thing over there and not really talking to each other and not really involved with each other, we can have more connection, more connection with each other, more connection between the campus and the community, between students and faculty and staff, and we have that. We're achieving that through civic engagement. So, Speaking Excellence Center is a great example of that. Uh, that's an idea that I've had for a while, uh, being here, that we need a lab for people who learn to give speeches. So, for instance, if I'm trying to teach you how to use PowerPoint and the projector, people don't have a cart and a projector and a screen at their house in their garage that they can practice with. So we need a lab for that. But communication skills take much more than that. So how can we get them involved for, uh, for instance, you know, giving uh, persuasive speeches or developing messages for the public uh, forum, right? Uh, how can we host debates and host SGA, right, and do the things that uh, communication uh, scholars would like to do in terms of uh, being involved in civic engagement? The Language and Culture Center. In the fall, we're going to have a common course reader, or, or common campus reader. We're going to be looking at the life of Malala, right? They called me Malala. But we're going to be reading her book, the book about her, the book that she wrote, I suppose. And that is really linked with our whole uh, campus theme dealing with grit and determination, right? You know, you're shot by the Taliban, and you still came back and said, you're not going to stop me, and she's a world leader. Right, in terms of look what I can do, this girl from a traditional culture that is able to stand up and do these things. Well, that's a big deal, right? And that's gonna be coming through to international education and the Language and Culture Center. Civic engagement can have a big piece in that, right? To help promote those kinds of values, that kind of example, uh, similar sorts of examples during the, during the fall semester as we get into that. The Honors College has participated in the Civic Engagement Program, uh, helping us with our hunger banquet, helping us with the free speech wall, the first one, first one of its kind on our campus this year. Um, the library, the community library, is a hub for the community, right? People come here to get information, to participate in programs, and we want to partner with them as well. So, you know, whether that's hosting events there, or they have a civic involvement program for community members, um, whether people come and get their taxes done, right? There's, uh, you know, whatever it is that, the, that gets done at the library, that's, that's a place for us to partner with them. So even as simple as a pet food drive, we did that in the fall, where 
people get food from uh, Meals on Wheels, but they have pets. They can't go out and get the food for the pets, so they end up giving the Meals on Wheels food, some of it, to their pet. So what we do is we give, we did a food drive and collected that for Meals on Wheels, and now they can give you know, little sacks of food for the pets so that the recipient can eat the meal that was intended for them, right? And then SGA has been involved heavily in civic, in civic engagement this semester. The president, Raul Martinez, has uh, come to nearly every event we've had and has promoted uh, activity through of the members to our particular uh, events, whether that's voter registration, whether that's debate watches or the hunger banquet. The SGA has been involved in those kinds of things and now we're even working on a recycling program for the campus and some members of SGA are hard at work at that. So you can see there's an interconnection to, you know, this is just some examples through uh, the civic engagement program that we're able to put more of the campus in touch with each other and it's hard to ignore, right, this kind of synergy that's taking place. All right, in the fall, I think we have some real opportunities to continue to build on this. For instance, with election, the election that's taking place. Uh, however that turns out, okay, it seems pretty crazy right now, but however that turns out, we will continue with our ritual election cycle in the fall. That is, we ritually have primaries, and we have, during the summer, the conventions, and then in the fall, we have the election campaign that typically follows a format. Well, we're gonna try to participate with that and get students involved. And maybe that's through more debate watch parties. What is that? You know, when we have the debates, we pro broadcast them and let the students come in and watch them together because instead of sort of processing this individually, what are other people thinking? What are the other ideas? Exposing people to different ideas is exactly the kind of thing that a civic engagement program would do. Not telling people what to think, but exposing them to other ideas so they can make an informed decision. So we watch for that. We, we, do, we do those kind of events, and you know, uh, the, the, it's interesting the interaction that takes place between students and faculty, between students and other students, okay, and they're able to make their decisions. Now, because it's a general election, I think that the sort of uh, conversation is gonna be really different than it has been in the spring where we've had just you know, partisan events. Voter registration will continue. We're going to want to people, have people involved because, again, Texas has a much lower uh, participation rate than other states, and that's kind of sad given how vociferous people are online. Constitution Day, I think this year, will probably have a lot to do with the election, okay, because it's a constitutional function, right, of us to uh, of the transition of power and so on. I think that we'll probably have. Uh, some uh, additional piece to that. We did a Constitution Day this fall and had really good attendance for the speaker from U of H that came. So we'll have issue forums. That is, even though the candidates are talking and doing their talk about this, we can have separate forums just about the issues that are dominating the political uh, landscape. So whether that's uh, uh, you know, safety and security, whether that's immigration, whether that's education, which education really hasn't played a big role so far, but they probably should talk about it some, right? That we should talk about those things here on the campus so that you're informed about the issue, which allows you to make a decision about who you might support. Candidate forums, uh, the SEC, the Speaking Excellence Center, I think will have also debates and, I, and, and activities that are surrounding the election. Uh, and then even the Trevor Life program, which uh, occurs and uh, is a shorter program, but then you know, we can have speakers there that are civic engagement based re re uh, speaking about the election. So those are just the ways that you know, on one particular issue, we can kind of involve people. So it's a pathway right, to civic engagement just through that particular event. Deliberative dialogues is a practice that's common. It's one of the, one of the ways that uh, we wanna have students to be uh, able to have civil conversations about hot topics. Communities are having a harder time being civil with one another. Civility is an issue, right, in many of our communities these days. Online, people just say whatever they want, right? They, they figure, well, they're not in front of me, I'll just say whatever I want, okay? But when we get face to face, how do we learn to do that? I think that the college is a great place before we send students out, we want them to be effective citizens. And so we want them to learn how to have conversations about these difficult uh, subjects. So 
through the National Issues Forum, uh, you get a discussion brief. And the discussion brief says, here is the controversial issue. And you outline it briefly. And then it says, all right, there are these sort of tensions around this issue, right? You know, this position, or this position, or this position. You divide the large group into smaller groups. Student leaders are in each group, right? They lead the discussion. And people voice their opinions back and forth in a civil manner. You just you know, you follow basic rules of etiquette about behaving yourself and not talking over somebody. And as the group kind of comes to a consensus about this particular part of that larger discussion, then the moderator says, all right, what did you decide? And this group says, well, we feel like, although this is true, we feel this way. And this group says, well, we talked about that too, but we felt this was so. And this group says, yeah, well, we agree with that group over there because that's how we came out. And you say, all right, let's go on to the next one. Let's go on to the next one. You do like two or three of those kind of discussions. And by the end, what you've done is you've spent time hearing each other out, knowing that you're not the only voice, knowing that other people have valid points too. On a controversy, people believe strongly on both sides, don't they? And that there's probably not one truth, but many truths in the community. And you can learn through that. So student run. You can do them in classrooms. And what we're looking for right now is a club or organization that would be interested in being mod trained moderators, which is easy enough to do. Trained moderators so that when a classroom in government or history or English wants to have a deliberative dialogue, right, even biology or something like that, right, that they can have the moderators come in and run a single class deliberative dialogue just for that session over an issue that they're talking about right now in the curriculum. And so there's lots of different topics as I've listed out here. <sighs> Public Achievement is a program that is national. It's been around a lot. It's here in Lone Star. In fact, Kingwood practices it pretty well. It has been stated by System Office that they would like to see all of our first year experience students in the Education 1300 class have a civic engagement dimension. They, they would like them to do a civic, be more civically engaged. So they want to assign something in the Education 1300 class before it's over to do a civic engagement project. Okay. Now what that's going to look like, we don't know. But we have an idea that public achievement practice might be the way to do that. So we want to, so I'm, I'm kind of previewing for you an idea that we have about this. Uh, to let you see how this could involve nearly every student on the campus, because they all have to take 1300, right? They all have to do that. How can this be done so that it leads into a mindset of being involved in the community? The long description of this says that everybody has the ability to contribute and participate. Everybody has good ideas. And that it's possible with coaches who are trained to get those ideas, to train people to work together to implement those ideas, and it doesn't really matter how old you are or what capacity you have, right, that if you work together, you can accomplish these things, and that it's not a government solution, it's not an imposed solution, it's one that, the, that in small groups people try to achieve. It's part of sustainable democratic societies. During the fall, a contingent from Lone Star went to Minneapolis where this is practiced uh, pretty widely. And we saw this in grade schools, in gifted and talented classrooms, and in people with special needs, classrooms with people with special needs. Kind of like our OLS program is coming up, right? You know, we're gonna have people who are going to get a college degree, but it's going to, you know, it's gonna be over a longer period of time, right? But still accomplish that. And we feel like that's something that can be practiced here at Lone Star and here at Tomball through the 1300 class. Here's my, my vision of that. In the 1300 class, they already have a lot of things that are going on, okay? They already have a lot of things that are going on, different assignments, different activities, different things that they have to learn, financial capacity and what, it, what happens when you get too stressed out and you know all the things that are involved in that, learning to, to develop grit. Well, here it says you develop your public narrative and learn one-to-one -one conversations as a way of doing a civic engagement project. So what does that mean? 
A public narrative is exactly what Malala does with her experience. She has developed a story about herself. It's not everything about her, but it is the public story that she tells as a way of explaining her involvement in the community, what she wants to do, right? What makes her who she is. You get the idea? Now, every student needs to learn to do that if they're gonna participate in public life, right? They need to learn how to express who they are and what makes them who they are. And it's not everything about them, but it is a public narrative. Now, that could be a single assignment in that class that gets you ready to work in public achievement. Second, you need to learn to have an effective uh, interaction with somebody where you develop a relationship with them and it's a conversation that has no particular motivation in the sense of, you know, I'm trying to get something from you. It's so that I can understand who you are and what motivates you. And I learn to do that with other people that I interact with. And the more that I do that, when, I, when it comes time to do something, I say, aha, we need to be able to achieve this thing. I know you're driven by this. And I know you're driven by this. Let's get together and see if we can't, you know, put that to work to solve this problem. Does that make sense? So you learn to develop relational conversations, these one-to-ones. It's a longer conversation to get to know the other person. And hey, isn't that the thing about civic engagement, right? That we separate, we disengage from each other. This is a way to get people connected to one another in a meaningful way. Now, that's all you do in the 1300 class. But as they come out of this and they say, I don't really like that, I wanna do more. Well, let's train you as a coach and let's start a program at, let's say, the elementary schools that surround us. Tomball Elementary, which is a Title I school, right? Cedric Smith Elementary, which is up on Hardin Store Road, less than four miles from here, okay? And it is in one of the more poorer areas of our service area. And then Creekside Elementary, right next to the new Creekside Center, that is surrounded and fed by people who live in half million dollar homes. talk about three distinctly different populations and let's say we take a fifth grade class or two from each one of those schools send college student coaches in as part of a partnership with them right you wouldn't just go in and say here we are hope you like it right you would partner with them but let's say we take a fifth grade class or two from each one of those campuses and start working on you know them getting to know each other and working in groups and deciding what they really want to change about their community or about their school, right? Things that they really want to attack. Getting them to get their ideas out, right? Start planning who's going to do what, right? How are we going to achieve it? Setting goals, right? And by the end of the school year, did they achieve that goal? All coached by college students, easy enough, right? And maybe even partnering those schools together. Tomball Elementary and Cedric Smith and Creekside talking to each other, because what about students from a Title I school talking to Creekside Elementary, right? Those are some people from different experiences, isn't that, right? Different, different life experiences. We, want, we don't want people separated, right? The gap is growing, right? We don't want that bigger gap. We want people to come together. And these are all in our service area, all handled by Tomball students and very close to us, right? They don't have to, students don't have to travel far to accomplish this. If they don't want to do that, right, maybe public achievement isn't their thing. There are other pathways, as I've already outlined, right? Internships, service learning, debate watches, right, hunger banquets, right? There are other pathways that, from the 1300 experience, the students say, yeah, I would like to be more involved. This doesn't sound like me, but maybe one of these other ones do, right? So we capitalize on that experience and the first year experience to accomplish this, you see. That all make sense? So what other future project ideas? I have a lot going on, okay? A lot of things that I would like to accomplish, and I think over time, we have the capacity to do these things. And this, doesn't even, this is not even an exhaustive list. There are other things that are not listed here, like a center for oral and local history, which uh, a professor out of Kingwood just got a grant for from the chancellor to develop a, a library of oral histories and local history stories that can be stored that tells the story of the community and that students could collect them through a basic activity that's a service learning activity around the country oral history pra practice i've had my students do that but look here we should have a volunteer center on our campus 
After Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina and Rhea, we did develop a volunteer center because there were so many community needs at that time. So many people living here that had been displaced. Um, you know, and efforts to coordinate who's got what and who can help where, right? The campus wanted to do stuff, but there were so many voices, we needed one voice, right? A place where the information could come in and where the students could go out. And so we could do that here. Student run, they would track service learning, for instance, they would maintain a database of service sites and maintain a database of students who wanted to do certain kinds of uh, that and do the matching. That would be easy enough on the campus. Digital literacy. One of the pieces that I think is really important. Our students have a lot of technology. They have access to it by coming here as students. They use it frequently, but they haven't had a lot of training. You open the box, you turn it on, and you start using it. You download the app, you don't even read the agreement, right? You say skip, right? And you start using it. And as a result, our students need to be able to handle that technology in, and various kinds of technology. I see my friend Monty here who is developing a lot of recording capacity, right? You know, things that, you know, a media, a media capacity here that I think will be tremendous as a tool for students, but how do they do it, right? How do you use something like Camtasia? How do you use the one button, uh, uh, you know, cart that's gonna be developed, right? What, how do you do that kind of thing? What's out there? So, like a math lab or a writing lab or the SEC, right? We should have a digital uh, literacy lab, right? Digital literacy center. And that we should teach students how to create, right? Because they are uh, already creating messages, right? To curate information when they research, they should be able to find quality sources and know, what to, know how to separate that out, know how to interpret the information, and how to communicate effectively over the when not to say something. Because I think that's how we get in trouble, right? Is people say th say things at the wrong time or in the wrong way, right? And they've never been trained on that. So those things could be taught here. Public health campaign, working with the health science building, right? Working with uh, the free clinic like Tomagua, which is over there next to nearby them. I think that we could be helping with something like, for instance, Zika virus that's coming up. Cases are already being found. Houston is one of those major centers that's going to be impacted by the Zika virus. We could have speakers, we could have forums, we could have uh, trainings, right, that could be making a difference, and that's a civic involvement, right, in terms of meeting the need of the community and that kind of, uh, that kind of need. So creating awareness and showing, showing people how to address that need. We could be doing that, and I, I do have as a goal in the next year to have more civic engagement events not only here, but at our centers, the health science building, the Creekside location, I think that we need to not just be holding them here on campus, that they should be elsewhere. Uh, global, and global Youth Service Day has been around for decades now, and it is something that you start planning in the fall, and then in April, you do the project, right? Well, this is something that is youth run, that there's grant funds for, and it can be just about anything, a service learning project or a, you know, a, thing for the uh, working on the environment because Earth Day is in April as well. Uh, there's just so many projects from around the country. In fact, Texas is one of the leaders in the world on Global, Global Youth Service Day. It's sponsored by, I think, State Farm. Uh, there's a lot of money behind it, and it would be a, a simple sort of thing that the campus could do in a variety of ways. And then AmeriCorps volunteers, uh, VISTA volunteers. This is something that is a federal program that um, comes from the Corporation for National and Community Service. Uh, I've actually been trained as a VISTA supervisor. And it's kind of like having work-study students. They would be assigned to us, they're in a database, and they could each have, I could have, if, if we were to get the grant for it, uh, a student who would be involved for different, assigned to different activities. So helping with internships or helping with the hunger banquet or helping with trying to accomplish the public achievement pro program. And that's what they, they would live, VISTA volunteers typically live at poverty level, but when they're done, after their two years of service, they typically get a, an education stipend that helps them finish their education. So there's kind of a payoff to that, right? They get the experience, plus they get the uh, financial payoff. I'm not quite, quite sure whether that's still exactly the same way as it was, but uh, I know that they got re-appropriated re, uh, 
um, in the last year. So um, this all is part of our involvement in the democracy commitment. I'm just showing you the logo for the organization. The democracy commitment is part of a larger national effort, uh, the American Democracy Project, which is at universities. And it's higher education, learning, uh, teaching students right, about civic involvement. Right? That's what we want them to do. We want them to become engaged in the community. And the, the annual conference is in June. Uh, Professor Gilbert and I have been to the, one, the last one uh, last year, and it has so many different avenues by which we can start to practice these things on our campuses. And um, we, we feel like we're, we're making a difference here at Tomball, and system-wide, we're making a big difference in terms of helping people to achieve that outcome of civic engagement, of being a person who not only sees the need knows how they can be involved and wants to do something about it. Right? And we're giving people a variety of opportunities. We're not doing everything. Other campuses are doing some things like the human library. They're doing, the, they're doing that in some campuses. We're, we're not doing that quite so well. Some of the speakers that have come to other campuses didn't come to ours. We're bringing in ones that they didn't have. For instance, our free speech week is something that no other campus did. So we're, we're achieving it in the Tomball way. And uh, I feel like we're having a lot of success at that. So uh, I, I appreciate you being here. I don't even know what time it is. So I have, how much time do I have left? Five till? So not bad for a, just about an hour. So I'll be happy to field any questions you have. Um, but it's just to say that there are so many benefits, right, to civic engagement. It's not doing it just because the system said so, right? We're doing it because we know that that's the historic purpose of community colleges. The historic purpose of community colleges is to develop effective citizens, right? We want people to participate in democracy effectively. And they learn that this is the last stop before they go out and live their lives. We want them to come out, be able to participate effectively, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. And there's so many dimensions of that. And again, it's not something I have to invent, right? I don't have to come up with new project, projects. The people who are helping me, who are participating with this, they're all making the projects, uh, whether that's Professor Lowry and his biology students working in the wetland, or Professor Gilbert working with SGA, or Shannon Marino in, in Student Life, or PTK that is work, working with uh, cancer, you know, whatever it is, right, the, the groups that are involved have their own motivation and drive, and they know as well as I do that the civic life of students is one of the paramount purposes here. It recruits students, it helps us to retain students, it helps them to persist, and it helps them to achieve what, they, what their goals are, helps them to consider their careers right, in a different way. And so I think that we get a lot of benefit from that. Our students do, but the community benefits as well. So I appreciate your time today, here just before we go off to our spring holiday, and I'll take any questions that you have. Can I start first? I've got about, like about one minute. Okay. Two minutes. Uh, fantastic yep. ideas. I, I, I'm, uh, and it, it just kind of brings up things that, you know, overall, you know, one thing I, I definitely would like is a, a good internship program that covers a lot of different disciplines. Mm -hmm. I think that would be wonderful for students. And one of the biggest things you find out from four year institutions and also out there in the real world is there's not enough experience. There's not enough. You know they're not ready for that yet. Well, they say, "How do you get ready?" You know, well, we would. I think what we need to do as a community college is to invest into getting internship programs and, and uh, these civic programs that they can get into that shows, "Hey, I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. What do I need? You know, to do more? You know, and things like that." And I think uh, I'm taking a social. Uh, media class right now, which is really, uh, I, I see where that could be a great force for engaging students mm -hmm. and faculty and mentors. Mm -hmm. And I think mentorships are, are very important for for students. Uh, we're we're doing it, and I think we're going to be looking at doing a lot more. We're going to be offering services for the, um, you know, in our new hopefully new studio, which is coming hopefully uh, by fall semester to have collaborations with students and faculty and staff to be able to do media and learn about media. We're putting together a uh, uh, instructional technology 
certification program to get faculty more in tune with technology and mm -hmm. how they can make it available to their students and how students can learn from that because it's, they can't have one without the other. Well, think about the prevalence of video in social media right now. But it is, it's growing. That's, the, that's a huge piece of social media, but what if that were used in a, for a public good? Right, for creating awareness, for drawing people to this, for generating volunteers for a particular group. And that's the whole idea. What I've learned about social media is it, it's a, an extension of our marketing program out there. It's, mm -hmm. it's about getting involved in uh, events and uh, social gatherings and community efforts and things like that based on another idea. You know, it could be, you know, promoting Lone Star College, Tomball, mm -hmm. but it's a bigger picture. Well, and the, the thing that everybody needs to understand is that the promotion of Lone Star College Tomball and Lone Star System generally comes from word of mouth more than anything else, wow. and positive okay. word of mouth, positive word of mouth. Exactly. When our students are out there doing good things, making a positive difference for others, they go home and they say, that Tomball student did this, that Lone Star student did this, and that is gold, right, in terms of the community. They can't believe that our students are involved. For instance, the first time I ever sent students out to service learning, the, the first time I sent them, the person who received them said, what do you do, what judge sent you? What, what you know, <laughs> you stand over there. And they were rude to them because the only reason a person of that age group would want to do community service was because a court ordered them to. And they had no concept of the fact that the student <coughs> might actually learn something from the service and that they were wanting to participate. So if we're out there building a community garden, if we're out there uh, helping kids with a, a particular food drive or something like that, partnering with a school, right, that's going to make a difference and creates that positive word of mouth. I really look forward to uh, you know tapping into some of that information you oh, have about social media. Read my water for my presentation. Yeah, I need to get it. That's right. I sent you. Okay, I'll get it. Good job. See you later. Thank you. Take care. Any other questions for me before we wrap up for the day? Besides your class, yes. uh, what other examples exist now amongst the Tomball classes of students doing service learning? Oh, um, we've had service learning in so many different places. Uh, psychology, um, uh, English classes, government classes. Uh, for instance, the honors government class has participated in both semesters in doing some service learning. Um, students working in uh, for nursing and occupational therapy certainly are working in the community to learn their craft right while serving others so um, you know uh, health tests for schools for instance vet tech used to do uh, with the county they would do vaccinations you know pre vaccination days uh, things like that um, we've had students who have worked um, in the library for instance helping seniors to understand uh, you know how to download an ebook, right, and and use their e-readers when those became popular. So um, throughout the campus, in every division, there have been people who have practiced service learning for a single assignment or for a whole course. Uh, it just depends on you know the amount of involvement the faculty member wants to do and what the need is for the community. We always base. This is something that everybody needs to understand. We always base what we do based on what the community needs first. It's not what we can do, it's what they need us to do. So for instance, um, the uh, Society of Samaritans in Magnolia right now has their 30th anniversary coming up. They are um, mostly seniors who are running that organization. They have a Facebook page, but they'd like to have more stuff on YouTube. But they don't know how to do that. They'd like to be able to have a new brochure made up, but they don't know how to work the technology to make that accomplish make that happen. They'd like to have some volunteer help at some of their events, right? And so multiple different kinds of disciplines or groups could help this group as they go through their 30th anniversary here from the beginning of the year until like I think May or June is when they start wrapping that up. So you see, um, it, it depends. So you know? is there a clearinghouse where members of the community and the faculty and students can, can converge to make Mm -hmm. to match up matchmaking yeah is there such a thing like that well we have a database of needs from the community not everything gets placed in there we um, the students are assigned to that through their class but a student may also um, do an honors contract for instance although I think they're changing that in the honors college now 
but they used to be able to come in and say, hey, I would like to do a service learning project, and they say, oh, well, let's give you some honors credit for that, and you would do that. I think that they've changed that now. There's actually now, in the Honors College, a civic engagement sort of uh, pathway or emphasis that you can do uh, for that. Uh, and so you're looking at the clearinghouse for Tomball campus, right? That is, if a faculty member wants to practice in their class, they come and see me, and I say, here's how you do it. And then, he wants your attention. Don't forget your back. And, uh, <laughs> and then if um, students are looking for sites to go to, hopefully the faculty member already knows where they want the students to work, and they've already made that partnership. You know, there's really little um, sort of influence or interference on my part in terms of how the faculty member gets it done. There are standards by which you do it effectively, and I try to impart that by training the faculty member. Um, but if the faculty member says, I don't know where to go, I could say, how about this, how about this, how about this? And you've heard me in the talk here list off several locations that I'm familiar with in the community. So even if you don't know the Tomball community very well, I, I've been here over 10 years now. I know where things are. I've lived in the area for much longer than that. And I can tell you, hey, try this or try this group. And uh, so like this semester, an, an EDUC 1300 faculty member said, I want my students to go out and, and participate in the community um, and, and learn to um, learn to manage their time well or something like that. So I said, well, how about this? There's a homeschool speech and debate group that has their regional tournament coming up here in February. And it, it was during February. And I said, they need judges. They need 200 judges for all these homeschool kids. And it's a Christian group, so you know there are some Christian-oriented things, but most of it's like speech and debate, you know, impromptu and policy debate, things like that. So you know, go and have them, uh, you know, offer an hour or two of their time to judge some rounds. Oh, that's great. The majority of her class went out and did that. You know, they found the time over three or four days to do it, and they volunteered their time. The faculty member got the note back and then gave credit based on what, you know, what she thought it was worth. Do we capture their story somewhere? Um, we do when there are, when the faculty member has a written component frequently. Um, reflection is a big part of what we do through civic engagement. That's not something I spend a lot of time talking about, but I appreciate you asking. Um, and that is, how do you get the learning out of the activity? You gotta reflect on it and think back. And so, that may be a class discussion, not so easily captured. It may be an online discussion. We could capture that, maybe. Sometimes it's a paper, and I frequently will get people uh, commenting that way. And then I also do a survey um, at the end of some semesters where I say, oh, your class did service learning, can you have your students fill out this survey? And there are frequently com uh, responses to questions and then a narrative piece that they can write in as well. So we sometimes get some feedback like that. Most every student who does this says, boy, there needs to be more classes like this. Most every student who does this says, I got a lot closer to the material because of this. Most every student who does service learning says, I really you know, got a better connection with my professor because of this. You know, and I persist. I'm, I'm going to come back for another semester. You know, because of that. So these are all good outcomes of that. And we do capture that in that way. If a faculty member has an idea mm -hmm. of doing something new, mm -hmm. would it be the first step to, to come to you, talk, to share with you that sure. idea, and sure. see what you think? We'd love to have you. Yeah, we'd love to have you join join in what we're already doing, right? And if you have an idea, then your your idea may be just right. It's like I'll just say go, right? If I have other things to add to it, then I can certainly, you know, point you in the right direction. There's something that I'm, I, will, I will be teaching a business class okay. this summer, mm -hmm. and I have to have in my hands, on my jump drive, mm -hmm. a social entrepreneurship curriculum for adults okay. that I'm meaning to test with students. Okay. So I'm thinking of taking snippets of that yeah. and using it in my business 1301 class. Okay, I think that that sounds that, that sounds really interesting. Has anyone else done something like no, that? No, I haven't heard a, heard a thing very much like that. Social entrepreneurship has, is a relatively new sort of thrust. Uh, I've been reading articles about that, but I don't remember anybody here on campus really practicing that. And, and that's not to say that it hasn't been done, I just haven't heard it, okay? And um, I think it would be great for you to, to try it out. Now, in a summer class, it depends on what you want to achieve and what the community needs, right, as to whether that's going to be, you know, do you render meaningful service to the community? That's a, a really important phrase that I use when I train people about service learning is, you know, what's the meaningful service? Will the student get meaning out of it? Will the community get meaningful service out of it? Because if you're doing it and it's too fast, 
and it, you know, what's the point? And if you're doing it and the community doesn't really get anything out of it, you know, or the student doesn't really learn anything, what's the point? So it, it may be something that you can do on a different scale depending on what your project is, where you can do a small snippet and it works, or on a longer 16 week schedule it works better and that's when it should be done, right? How does community of Tomball become aware that there is a place they can turn to to ask for assistance? Because uh -huh. they know you, you're the go-to person. Yeah, to yeah. yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that if you walked down the street and said my name, people would know who I am and what I do. But we have had sufficient involvement with corners of this uh, community, whether that's the ISD, whether that's the health community, whether that's uh, Tomball Emergency Assistance Ministries, which helps a lot of different people, Northwest, um, Habitat Northwest, um, both SciFair and we have had partnerships with them in the past, uh, YMCA, we've done things with them, uh, the, the one at Cypress, uh, Cypress Wood, we've, we've worked with them. So, you know, the, there are groups within the community that know that the college does uh, have a service learning project. We promote what we do through the news when it's when we think it's newsworthy. Sometimes it gets picked up, sometimes it doesn't. So you know the, the word is out there, uh, and of course my administrators are happy to go out and tell people, oh, you know what, I know a guy who can help you with that on my campus, and then they send them to me. So yeah, we, we, we try to we try to express that as much as we can, and, and again through the faculty members, they have their connections, and they know the community need that exists, and then they try to turn their students toward that. And that's how we get that out there. To what extent do any of you, the counterparts of the different campuses, mm -hmm. cohere or coordinate? Do you all do oh. your own thing? Well, we have system committees. So, for instance, we have a leadership committee for the Center for Civic Engagement. Um, the service learning program, you know, on some campuses has kind of uh, dwindled over time. We're trying to restart that on several campuses, and so we communicate with each other and give give each other ideas. Uh, at the end of April, there will be the Educon uh, conference uh, for Lone Star, and there will be presentations. Uh, Professor Gilbert and I are, for, for instance, going to talk about civic literacy uh, there, and you know that will be a way for us to you know uh, put the word out as well. So yeah, we we work together in a lot of different ways. Yeah, yeah. and it's only been only about a year old or so. Well, the civic engagement centers are just start, just starting out. Um, the practice of service learning and reflective thinking is over 100 years old, so you know depends on what you want to what you want to say. In terms of my practice of service learning on the campus here since '02, um, but I'm not the first one to do it. There were people doing it here before my before me. So, um, for instance, Joe Cahill, if you know him, he he uh, was practicing service learning. Lost. Yeah, yeah, he was practicing service learning in the Cypher area before there was a Cypher campus. Okay, and he was doing like uh, this uh, simulated city project uh, with his students, and uh, that was working really well. If you ask him about it, he can tell you some great, some great stories about that. Great. So, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? No? I'm sure there will be in the future. Well, I'll, I'll be happy, happy to meet with you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Patrick, nothing. I think we've lost our audience, so thanks very much. <laughs>